this time and we'll give our honest feedback because we know that that's what she's doing. She's going to make it out. Yeah. 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 And I think that there's, there's definitely a parallel that we would have this as I said. It's a new pocket recipe for the next card and a bar in your pocket that you can go back to again and again. again. It's very much before my idea of the start is to then be able to better understand the process. So even having that as you put it, that, that invitation to come to the is like, here's a little recipe for the start list. You know that you're going to have at least a certain amount of success, as you say, you stick to your sanitation and follow the recipe. But then, year after year after year, as you're going to understand the kind of tweaking of those variables that you might have in all the large parts, it's very much more hard. And that's something that I, I intend to continue to do. And once I fall off the end of the 80 shilling, I'm not sure. I think that there's a way to balance having some experimentation with some work, not all the time. I, I want to be able to is that the program for you? Is that some, some sense of having a control that, that allows you from year to year to have a certain Because I, I mean, I can see, I can see it, it, it lately when that stuff is not dealt with as much as I'm used to. And we've been able to do it as well as and, and my thought is half of what I'm worried my stock restaurant is is like not crazy, crazy ideas. But, but there's a sense of that, that control experiment. Being able to compare these out and see that we're on a chart over time and I'm kind of on for three or four years obviously. I, I tickle the thought that we can do that soon. You know, a year from now, and, and that, that effort, by being patient, that effort pays out. I, I don't know that I attribute it to the program. It's sort of serious study on reflection. And I think it's also for me, it's something that uh, there's a saying my my teach as much as part of the you at the party stuff. Yeah, in a way. Yeah, because because art, I mean, people, people have I, not people that program. Sure, sure. But if people have these impressions of artistic pursuits as being winged and new strikes, it's, it's not. There's a lot of practice and diligence and willpower that goes into it. There's a lot of reflection and study that goes into it. To get to a level where you can 
play that one. So it's two very complimentary experiences to say I've never done this in the world. I've the American Pale Ale. I've never done the Pale Ale. I've 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 done the Pale Ale. Complimentary to that work back in this program. And now you like proper ways to have a piece of paper and I can stretch out different ways. It's not as crazy like I know, but I can still lay around. Different dimension or different scope of the I want to reflect on that. I just want to add one of the that process and I think that's what we both love about over in general is that it is another form of value. Bounds between um, um, art and science, um, but I always think of art and the, cre the creative process as being this uh, AB a -A toggle switch that goes back and forth between making a mess, cleaning up a mess, making a mess, cleaning up a mess, and it's, it, as, you, as you go further down that road, you find that you're, you're, you're constantly, you can't do both at the same time. You can't. Create a mess and clean up at the same time. You have to sort of just like throw caution to the wind, abandon everything, and just make a mess, and then go. Okay, how can I like pull from this, extract from this some sort of um, uh, viable, usable thing? Discard the rest, kind of refine this, and then I, I don't know. There's all for me. There's always that. I think you think of book writing. You 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 type out statically, type out a whole bunch, and then you sort of like know how to call and edit. But you have to have both of those processes of being um, the baby throwing throwing uh, paint on the wall and smearing it all over and then going, being the critical editor who can say, okay, now what would I do different and how can I, which part of this is keepable and which part of this should I throw away. But that's, I mean, that's part of my point when I say I think there's a certain amount of discipline and willpower. I mean, it, it is equal parts, as you say, yeah. kind of creative play and experimentation. I also was thinking about the role of kind of instructive failure, which we've touched on in this podcast too where you have to be open to screwing up and in screwing up as you say cleaning up from that mistake yeah, yeah. you learn something about how to do it the right way or, or you discover something completely new you hadn't considered sure. doing before you know it opens you up to a completely new territory where you're like i had no idea you could do and that find, finding a way not to it. take yourself seriously yeah. but at the same time you're taking the intention of what you're making seriously right? but but by i think it's important to consider that that the attention to detail and that kind of switching so as a writer switching over to the editing mode and, and I think you put that really well that it's two distinct ways of approaching the craft of writing right. and, and it applies and, and there are, are, are similar analogs in many other crafts and arts sure. but I think that that uh, doing that is uh, I think it's an underestimated hedge against frustration that if all you do is just go for the crazy and, and yes. play all the time. Yes. It's hard to get a sense that you're progressing, that you're improving, that you're able to, no matter how creative or interesting or out there the idea is, you still need like a solid base of, of skill yeah. to reach a particular target. So if you're not also paying attention to that sort of discipline practice and that study, then you're going to get, I think you're going to, you're, you're going to be very frustrated. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's a beautiful way to say it. Man, that was, that was well, well spoken. So what do you think of this? It's opened up and I, it's, I, I'm in love it with opens it. up differently from the second one. I'm, 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 you know, this is taking me back which to the last time we had confirm. it. <laughs> it's, it's got a, a, the, the, a little bit of a stringency as it warms up and a little, I recall, little I recall we were, we were, Getting astringencies in some of our earlier beers too, and in a way, the roast might have covered some of that up, and now it's starting it's to reveal a little. A little. Um, that that, but I, what I've detected in this 
and maybe this is because I've been drinking a lot of sours lately, mm. is is a sense of sour that I actually really like. So mm -hmm. I'm not, I, it's it's not oh, unpleasant it's not at all, pleasant. but that no, no, sense no. of that astringency where you're talking about that that sense of astringency also to me feels a little bit like a sour mm. in a good in a good way. Um, no, it's, it it's not off-putting, but it's it not. It doesn't leave an off, off I, I think at all. We'll, we'll find the finish on on the next batch considerably different. I think we'll find the experience of it warming up considerably different from from this one. It still has some carbonation to it. If you mm -hmm. like slurp it across your tongue or something, or swirl it, you get this. You get a little bit of carbonation left. In no, and that that was it's definitely still, it's going still. But one, I mean, one of my concerns when I made this, because as I said, it, it was the first one that I had uh, yeah. charged. It was. It, Getting priming right was definitely something where I think you and I kind of converged from yep. different ends and shared some thoughts and true, some experiences true. on that. And this one, I was really, really concerned that it was undercharged all throughout. And I figured out one of the things I figured out with successive beers was temperature actually affects charging. And so charging it in the cellar where I do the primary and secondary and do long-term conditioning, not so good for charging. The yeast gets a little slower and a little sluggish, so it takes longer to get there. And this beer, to your point, totally got there. I'm very happy yeah, where it yeah, ended up. It was, but I was so anxious early on. And I was like, oh, I totally screwed up. Um, at, but I do think, you know, I've adjusted the, the priming sugar just a little bit. You're still using uh, DME, DME a lot. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, 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 like think it. it's, I think it's kind of funny because I think the first recipe book you looked at that was the priming sugar was dme like that well for this one the, yeah, yeah the clone yeah. recipe and you, it was and you stuck DME. with that and that whole it. book he used for the most part he used dme throughout yeah. that whole book i believe and uh, i came in and the first recipe i had was sugar and I, so i've always kind of ended up and then for like one of our first stuff. like real strong collaboration we just looked the difference <laughs> we used a little bit of sugar a little bit of and it's DME. funny because they're different and proportions they're different amounts oh, yeah. you know but it, it, it does it kind of works out and I think both of them impart sort of a different thing. I think this, maybe because the DME is more, uh, dried malt extract is more di easily digestible by yeast, that you get this more effervescent um, a bubble. It seems to me like the bubbles are tinier. I don't know if that's, I don't more know if that's just, it yeah. seems that way to me, but I don't, I don't know. I mean, but it's, it's hard to, to, there's so many things that affect the the head formation or retention though too. I mean this yes. is, we have to remember an oatmeal stout, so you've sure. got the proteins from proteins the oatmeal which are, which are, that are going to affect head retention and head formation. Reduce, and, reduce most yeah. likely yeah. head retention, yeah. But but it is also going to lead to a, a finer beating, and I, 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 I think we've done some other beers where the charge has taken longer than we expected. And that's been a result when it does take longer to charge as you get a finer beaded head, more like what you get off of like a hand-drawn uh, yeah, yeah. beer, you know, or, or the nitrogen-charged beers sure, that are sure. intended to kind of simulate that as you get a, a creamier, smaller, uh, you know, more tightly beaded head. This is beautiful. I'm so glad you shared this with me. I, I really appreciate it. It's a lovely, lovely beer, and I uh, um, can't wait to try the next one. <laughs> My my only lament is that that yes yeah, that uh, I I didn't have the foresight to sell our three big bottles. Every beer since this one, I've sold at least three big bottles, so I can do up to three years. You're a better but, man than me. <laughs> I try, but at least That's I had the one. So. <laughs> Ooh, that was a pop. That's oh, and quick, but not bad. Speaking of the uh, various differences in charging, Ooh, yeah, this one too. The the head is very noticeably different because of one of the the differences in the uh, in the brewing the, the mistakes as it were although you know talk about instructive mistakes I'm, I'm really happy that we kind of did what this we did is, this is really fun continue please I, I didn't mean to cut you off yeah so one of the one of the things that I wanted to do was uh, to push more grain into this because we've been getting closer and closer to making that ever smaller step into all grain brewing and so we've been putting more and more grain and kind of playing with the grain bills. So this one's a bit more grain than the last one. And it was supposed to be the same proportions of the dark roasted stuff, the patent, the chocolate, and, and what have you. But I was distracted when we were doing the... Uh, those, was those juice, I blame juice. <laughs> we were, I was answering a... He had a, a question about the process <laughs> of brewing. And we bring our friends in to teach them. Yes. And with the understanding that they're going to actually contribute into the process, yeah, and they're going to yeah. go away with an increased desire to do it on their own, and you know we'll stand up more brewers he's that fun way. To, he's fun to brew with. Mm. Oh, oh yeah. 
There is the funny thing. It's is surprisingly. It, I, it may just be because I'm drinking this without a palate cleanser, but sure. it's surprising. It's more consistent than I thought it would. It be. is. It is consistent. Now there's more. There's more patent in this, and there's more of a effervescence in the yeast. I mean, it's definitely more of a vigorous, vigorous carbonation. Okay, uh, which but we it, were just, as we were just saying is something that you've learned over the course of the year and year and it summer. It subsides pretty quickly, it and it does. And the thing, the thing is, is that oddly, that extra carbonation sort of fills in the gap that the other one had heat for you know what i mean so yeah i mean it, the, the thing about this is that um what it lacks in in the heat of alcohol and uh two percent lower and two two point five percent lower in abv it makes up for in this sort of um the roast of the patent and then the alcohol heat or the, the alcohol heat is replaced by this carbonation which is sort of vigorous off the top i don't know if you're picking that up Does that make i think sense? that the shape of the glass makes a difference I, i've just got a, a straight wall oh, pint glass yeah. yeah because that's just what i have handy since we're uh, we're in a different environment here and uh yeah it's it's hanging out i also got the first pour i mean maybe no, it has I, no it's like as the as something even to too. this point but yours is like there's just a ring around the glass but, but if you look at it see in the middle it's still Fizzing, oh, fizzing. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's it's much more fizzing. chocolatey. I mean, you can definitely see the, the that chocolate. increased addition of, of the darker malts, the patent and the chocolate, yeah. like I was saying. But and I think you'll find as this opens more of the roast and more of the sweet chocolate comes out. Yeah, uh, as a consequence too. So the the prior one. It, it tapered off more into that astringency, a little more of that pleasant sour, a little more of the tang, uh, and and this one I I definitely found. Just drinking it straight up, not necessarily in in comparison right, to right. the the generation before it, as it warmed more of the the malt, more of the grain bill came out. So I'm I'm eager to see as this yeah warms in the glass whether that and and it'll be interesting to see how it ages mm. for, for a year from now too. I mean this is yeah, still young. Point. This is a young beer. How uh, this, we this was this. Uh, bottled in January, so it's uh, yeah, yeah. not even a half year old yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a, it, she's young. At, the, at that ABV, might if you sell it right, it'll last for a few more years. Oh, it our thankfully our our sub sellers are very consistent. Yeah. I did a I did like a five six months. I have jealousy for that because I, I, yeah. I miss having my my basement basement. As we've talked about, hey, you can sell your stuff in my sub cellar. It'll be fun to you do. You trust a, me. Uh, if I if I can store my own beers and not drink them, I'll I'll store your beers and not drink them. You're, you're you're crazy good. You have much more discipline in the uh, not drinking it's your the cellar. years okay. of making mead where yes. the the conditioning, let alone aging, the conditioning can take up to a year if you want to do it right. I've, I've mentioned this this before, but uh, the first time I went to pick up brewing supplies at Flying Barrel, uh, I, I I got to the counter at the same time. A, a couple got to the counter, and I was like, "Oh no, please go first And the, and the, Dave, the, uh, the the cashier who, and the owner proprietor, basically said, "said Oh no, you first. They're mead makers. They're they're more patient than you." <laughs> <laughs> that's it's so that's in a nutshell. It's totally so true. true. <laughs> I I love the instant gratification of beer, and I think that that's okay. I think, and and as just an aside to once again encourage people to homebrew, I think there's a there's yeah, there's a little bit of a weight, but beer can be pretty gratifying quickly. I mean, by comparison to, to wine or, or mead, I mean, and wine, of course, and, and spirits. I mean, you've really got to be a patient. The nice thing is you can go both ways with beer. I mean, sure, if, if, a, you, if you make exactly a very right, stable yeah. beer, you can invest the time so you can that's do something, right. whether it's for right. a vertical tasting like this, or you just make something that you want to hang I, on to I, and you want to see how it mellows and integrates over time. I'm finding myself more and more that. wanting to make bigger batches. Maybe, maybe maybe it's just that I don't have the opportunity to make beer as often, as often yeah. but it's also I want to make big kind of contributions every time. Like, okay, here's, here's a 10-gallon batch and... and um, yeah, I kind of want to make something special. This yeah. one, I it went so fast, so fast. and, and mine's, I'm, mine's I'm very glad that I yeah, put I put three bombers in the cellar, so there's two more siblings of this beer yeah. for for successive yeah. years. So we'll get to the point where we can do three in a row, yeah. and possibly even four in a row, which would be really yeah. really wild. But there's a four pack for Balticon. There's yeah. two more set yeah. aside for our yeah. friend Carl because I 
promised him that I would send along some of our, our post uh, Nation's Attic beers in appreciation for inclusion. So I've got two bottles set aside for that. That's fantastic. But yeah, everything, you know, I gave you a six, I gave Chooch a six, I gave each of you a bomber, I gave my father-in-law a bomber, I brought I, some into work, I brought some more into work. And then when I was done, it's like I had like a six pack and a half or so left for myself. Yep, yep. And it's like, I can see that, that that being the case that making a seven and a half or ten gallon batch might be a little more desirable because yeah. it hangs in there a little bit longer. I don't think it's a lot more work. I mean, it's a little more bottling. It's a little more stove time, maybe huh? kind of creative thinking of how to how to maximize and pull out 10 gallons. I mean, we, we've gone up to about seven and a half Seven and a half works now. well with our existing it kit. Does, our yeah. our sparge rigs work difficult. pretty well with that. Our bottling rigs work pretty well with that. With the three carboys versus the two buckets, the blending gets a little weird. Yeah. Uh, and, and we had a concern, I remember, with one of the, I think it was the second, first or second batch on your rig of the pale ale, where putting seven and a half in 10 gallons worth of bucket that we had a concern that there was just a little too much head oxygen, room. too yeah. much headroom. Uh, so, I mean, for you, 10 makes more sense because then you're basically doing two five-gallon five gallons at the same time, yeah. and it better matches your, your primary and secondary vessels. Or yeah. seven would, seven and and half would work well, well in, your, in your space, or, or, or you could do 10. I mean, either way, I mean, another, another, t- you know, another two and a half gallons is, uh, you know, another half case or so of beer. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It goes that much, that much further, but... Yeah, yeah, might do, might do. I'm Especially sure. when they turn out this good. But there's, there's then also kind of the if you stick to the five gallon size, which most home brewers do. Yeah. There's, there is that built-in sort of urge to do the next one, and do the next one, and do the next one. So yep. it's, yep. it's tricky, as you say. You and I are both so, so busy with work. It's, it's tough to strike a balance where you're not. Like and, and the squeezing in brewing, too. yeah, at, at odd times when you'd really rather be resting or doing something else. Because it, it is still work. It is as much as we enjoy it, it's still work. Yeah. Oh, nice mm. beer. No, nice I'm very beer happy with it. It's definitely day. starting to starting to warm up in that that way that I remember. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I think the the hop. There's still a little bit of the same astringency, so there's still mm-hmm. something in, in the grain bill, even though the proportions shifted a little bit. Uh, I would be very curious to see if we do, maybe not the, the same, quite the same multi-rest, like reverse mash that we did on the chocolate, or the vanilla. I want to call it chocolate because it tastes like chocolate milk, but the yeah, vanilla yeah. porter, the jinx yeah. vanilla yeah. porter uh, that we did recently. Well, that Vanessa turned out so was, delicious. Vanessa was right. Uh, she, uh, she said, for the whole... Pour, of pour all of the vanilla. bourbon aged uh, vanilla into it. I don't know. That I, beer I, came out so darn close to perfect. It, I would want to ask it. It but is lovely. A, a little more sweetness. So so doing that that doing that um, that multi rest reverse mash. So starting at, at the lower temperature and going up. Since we are mashing on a stove top. Right. right. Um, there's something to that, you know, it brings a little more body, invites a little more sweetness, and with the chocolate and the patent, I think that that complements well. So I, I think that that might be uh, an intentional next step. I think I might not go quite back to the original grain bill on the last batch that we just tasted, because I do like bringing more roast and more chocolate out. I do like the way this opens and complements still that residual sort of tang and astringency, but just... Maybe one other note, just a little bit more sweet in the middle of that, too. Because huh. I know, like, when we were talking about this, and when I was asking you for suggestions of stout recipes to make, right. one of the ones I wanted to make, one of the reasons I wanted to make it, was the Worldwide Stout Club, Yes. Which yeah. is ver- a very challenging beer to make because it's so alcoholic. Yeah. And so it requires a lot more attention in the mashing. It requires a lot more attention in the fermentation. And it's not the alcohol that interests me, it, but it is that complexity and that sweetness and that depth. And, and that has to, hands down, be one of your favorite beers. You've, you've mentioned that in your top three, you think? Yeah. For Dogfish Head? Yeah. 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 Amazing beer, and we have a recipe for it. I mean, Sam actually shares yeah, that it recipe. It is, it is, it is it's intense. A challenging is. beer to pull off, and I'm, I'm, I don't need an 18 percent stout. But damn, I don't need, to, I don't need to put that much effort into it. Well, but but, but there are aspects of it that I would like to emulate more, and I think that that might yeah. be the next evolution of the sundial is a little bit more 
malt sweetness, just a little bit yeah, to, yeah, that. to round out that astringency, not eliminate it, because I think you're right, it does kind of clean out the finish, and it is, it goes well with the, the particular hop in this recipe, but just a little bit well, something more. I'm not, I'm not a distiller, but I, I, I'm reading more and more about distillation, and in, in an odd way, I think it's, it's influencing the way I think about home brewing in the sense that if you're going to distill, there's a part of you that knows you make a higher gravity board, beer, you make a higher gravity beer to start with to distill from because you're already kind of down that road. And, and I, I think because most beers that I could buy in a store are, for the most part, you know, in the sevens and eights, but they're very few and they're, then they get very expensive as you start getting into 12% beers. And, and I mean, the worldwide stout of 120 minute, for example. Yeah, those are beers that you buy like ten a single 12 ounce bottle at a time. Yeah, yeah. Well, one, you get one four pack bottole. You can put and together by the retailer, it's not put together that way by the distributor. That's and right. yeah, four packs, $35, $40, 50 yeah. easily. Yeah. So to me, there's a part of me that, well, I can buy that grain. I can buy yeast that will eat that grain. And I can make something that's really sticky sweet. And then there's a, there's a whole new challenge that as you get into higher gravity, um, you've knocked the yeast out. Figure, you have to yeah. figure out how to not only knock the yeast out, but you have to figure out how to balance it right, you know, to give it the right amount of bitter to. Yeah. So there's a challenge in these high gravity beers that. Someday. Um, that intrigued me, and I'm, I'm kind of aiming in that direction, you know. Someday. All right, all right, but, I, you know, I, I think it would be interesting if we were going to do that. I think it would be interesting to do another collaborative design where we kind of spitball and come up with a style. Oh, that, I'd love to do that, yeah. You know, so, you know, there's some respectable wheat heavies out there, but not a lot. Not compared to, like, high-gravity stouts. Like everybody does a high-gravity, you know, an Imperial yeah. Baltic yeah, or an Imperial Russian because stout. Because I think the bitter, the bitter of the roast. does balance it out. But, but yeah, taking, like, a, a, a chewier, maltier beer, like a wheat heavy, and yeah. finding a way to do that same balance. So finding some more kind of, uh, you know, using the roasted barley, using a, maybe aging even a peated, yeah, aged yeah, oaking yeah, it, you know, doing some aged, other yeah. things other than just hopping it per se to kind of balance it out would be challenging and interesting. So I'm, I'm down with that with the challenge, but it would have to be like a, you know, like a quiet time of the year where we've got some time to really think and kind of collaborate. Thing, yeah. I think so. I think so. Yeah. Kind of do something big like that and then put it in an oak barrel. Yes. Yeah. We talked about that. that I think that, that, that a really big beer like that we're, would be we're both, we're both supposed to have, uh, set aside a little for that. So, <laughs> so whenever you want to invest in one, I think I can. I can go there. I here. think the fall would be a good timing. Maybe maybe it would. Maybe, there, maybe there's the some would be a good some changes of foot I can't talk about yet. I think fall would be the right Ray, time. Ray, the right Ray seems to think this is a good idea. So. Yes, our our, our one time producer, our special guest, not <laughs> on the mic but helping us out with the audio, agrees with that. Ray, I, you like that'd the be more fun. A thumbs up. <laughs> you just see him through the glass. I feel like I don't know. This like, is, it's nice to actually have a have a recording studio to be in a recording. Studio. All those those television programs growing up, like WKRP, like uh, oh, even yeah. even uh, uh, Frazier, you know, because that was his day job was yeah. as a radio psychiatrist, yeah. and that interplay with him and his producer Ross. Yeah, I always feel like when I come in here, especially with the window into the actual c- control room, like. It just takes me back to watching it sure TV, does. It sure TV does. representations of well, that. I, re- I remember being in high school, and I, I remember being in middle school when I, as a geek, as a full-on pure nerdy little geek, I uh, I did AV. I was in the AV club, and I did AV. Uh, I did morning radio for my school, <laughs> and like did the weather report and played a few songs and gave updates and on on news. And uh, there's been mornings when I've come here. Uh, and set about the beginning of my day and then just started in on, on radio broadcasting that bring me right back to being in middle school and go, oh my god, oh, here yeah. I am. I'm still we exactly need a PA where I am. Here we in America we need a PA. We with John do doing show. morning announcements like, <laughs> lunch today will be macaroni and cheese <laughs> with tater tots. It was. Oh, it was great. I missed that so much. <laughs> and, and I remember Don't forget on Friday, Miss Smith's field trip is going to go to the local nature center. I am bowing to Thomas right now, <laughs> and I, I totally remember my first day on, on air and just being as nervous as hell and just, but but taking it so seriously, because t- to me the news, and, and we're in a place where we get to kind of report what's relevant and kind of analyze what's relevant in the news today, that uh, 
as hard as it as hard of a job as it can be, it has that reward that you kind of feel like you're doing something special. So, so I I, 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 I do like, like that. I, I yeah, having been a guest and I linked to this uh, yes. on, on my blog recently on the sidebar. And I'll, I'll drop a, another link in our show notes to the sidebar. Uh, but this is the the podcast here at New America that John's been. Uh, so instrumental in getting off the ground and I do love the fact that it has that sort of topical newsy focus and, and the pitch, the, the value in the intro is you know the stories that, that inform the news You know, so it's a sidebar in the news of the day and bringing in the, the wide variety of experts that we have so my companion in the episode I was on was, was thrilling uh, Constantine as a, as a tech and science journalist you know it just brings an amazing wealth of, of information only at more historical dimension and being able to kind of play off of that was so much fun and it's all to John's point about in and around the news and finding ways so you know we don't have the luxury of being able to go out and do first hand reporting but we can bring a much deeper considered opinion second hand analysis fellows, the sports fellows that we have here with the various members of the program Deep that, thinkers all that have all. been on the sidebar yeah that just bring in a lot more information and context than you get in your typical sort of news bite. It's an honor to be on that team. And, and uh, well, just today alone, and we had Rebecca McKinnon on to talk about the blind, uh, barefoot, quote-unquote, barefoot lawyer from China who just left the U.S. Embassy there. And, I mean, you can't be any more relevant than this that. This is a, a former bureau chief for CNN, for CNN that covered China for over a decade. Yeah. Right as, so, you know, everybody talks about kinds of, kinds of they kind of take for granted the, the Chinese firewall and the censorship issues, and and it's it's more than that. And Rebecca's book, the the consent of the network, that's out recently, which is a, a fantastic book, uh, and and just everything that she does with uh, Global Voices that she co-founded since then, yeah. um, or since since her time at CNN, I should say she's been doing that for a while. Uh, but in and around that space, bringing that that depth of interest and that that depth of information, so it's more than just oh, there's censorship in China, there's a lot more to it in terms of like self-censorship and like local propaganda that makes it far more concerning. And she's one of those voices that's drawing attention to the full spectrum of the issues of concern there, not just to a far, you know, just a simple firewall, it's far more than that. And yeah, and, and whether it's, yeah, the blind lawyer is a good story or the ongoing issues with uh, the artist Ai Weiwei and, and the things that, that he has to encounter bringing to... Uh, the board retreat here at New America that John and I both got to attend, and John did uh, a yeoman's job on the, on the AV in house and for the streaming and whatnot. She brought uh, a, a hacker guy involved with the hack spaces, uh, Isaac Mao, uh, to speak and, and telling an, a, another story that not a lot of people are hearing about people in China that still have this urge towards the DIY, towards. Uh, capitalistic entrepreneurship yeah. you know wanting to yeah. make and do creative and interesting things and not just purely for artistic reasons but for a, a wide variety of reasons in the market and elsewhere so yeah she's uh, if you can't tell she's one of my one of my favorite I mean, it's just, here just the, the ability to draw on that many deep thinkers all in one space and as the news obviously ebbs and flows and shifts from focus from one event to another uh, throughout throughout a news cycle and a weekly cycle, um, it, it's it's a lot of work, but it's also a lot of fun to sort of go, oh, what which story's relevant? What can we dig deeper into? What can we what can we uh, illuminate that hasn't been illuminated in this thing? And uh, that, it, it's just a wonderful it's it, it's just an honor to show up and be able to sort of help push that out the gate and just well, sort of get these ideas. At, at, at the risk of extending this sort of New America love that sure. so much of, of what we do in the various programs. So John and I are kind of on, on two sides of the house, as it were. John works uh, in and amongst our kind of core operations team who do you know, all of the administrative support. They to handle our external relations, publicity, multimedia, you name it. You know, it's that, that core team that kind of coheres New America, builds that identity, gives us this fantastic channel to talk through. Uh, but the programs, if we didn't have access to that, if we didn't have John doing such a good job to help us communicate and represent, we would be far less effective at our job. So it's this wonderful, I, I don't use this word often in, in a genuine, earnest way, but this wonderful synergy between the two sides of the house that we're able to uh, give John that experience with just an amazing diversity of voices and talent, but then those talents individually have access to something that they might not be able to cultivate on their own because there's a steady, consistent, persistent 
multimedia guy here who's you know knows how to make it, things sound well, knows how to run the live event space well, and just really drives that identity of me. As, as a as a producer, two two things you you want to amplify the conversation, but also it's just an, an insanely rewarding thing to be able to work with so much content. I mean, it's a dream come true to be in a place where there is so much relevant uh, and rich layers of content just just within an arm's reach at any at any point in the day. Um, I, I don't get bored easily because it just as a, a, being in a think tank that's so um, multi multi layered and 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 multi focused. Um, every day, I, I basically have a different program in, and they talk about a totally different facet of of life. And so, yeah, it's it's great. And and my job is really made easy by having great content, and great content um, comes with great thinkers. So it's. it's I'll I'll, I'll bring this back a little bit to kind of where we started, and and to the you know that we fully explained. You know, we were I think a little coy at the start about being in a new space, and we're we're just here in new america's multimedia space because john has access it's late in the week and there aren't other demands on the facility so we can just kind of take advantage to squeeze in recording where we can and we talked about we had a, a full episode on like how do you uh squeeze the beer questing in and bring all that but, and and this is the podcast fits in that same mold of it's a, a secondary passion of ours so we have to kind of sometimes get creative uh but i hope i guess i want to put a like a plea out to the listener that to beg some patience that if we indulge a little bit in, in uh, really kind of lionizing New America and, and John giving some insight into uh, what he does and why he enjoys it so much and, and by extension this is also why I enjoy it so much it's very collegial it's a lot of different voices it's a lot of great talents to draw upon is when we talk about how busy we are this is why we're so busy we're not busy because we're just hammering away at a pile of rocks or you know at the coal face deep in a mine we're busy because it's something we're both clearly very passionate about for for a lot of similar reasons for some different reasons it's challenging it's rewarding so uh you know hopefully as as we struggle with podcast production to kind of squeeze things in if we're late from time to time this is all by way i think uh, to give you some sense of why (laughs) <laughs> the podcast is effective in the way that it is. Well, I, th- I think we've done a good job of staying on course, and it's it's uh, to both of our uh, uh, sense of uh, sense of uh, just uh, ju- it's an honorable task to dig into and roll sleeves up for. And I, I think we've done a pretty good job of sticking with it. So I hope I hope others will stick with us. As this beer finishes out, I want to remind people to look for us at Balticon to tweet us up, to write us at our website, livingproofbrewcast.com, and uh, find us in Baltimore. We're, we're going we're gonna to share a bunch of homebrew that we've made throughout the year. and uh, Including this one, the one we're finishing right now. A beautiful, beautiful beer, I should say. And uh, our, our crazy host, uh, great crazy producer uh, Ray in the, in the booth over there might might have to show up and help us with some uh, interview process as we uh, interview a bunch of authors who are also beer drinkers and beer lovers and articulate their uh, tasting notes quite well. You did well. such a good job of it last year. You really did help us last year and, and as we're hoping to do more because I'm hoping to avoid the uh, the stomach illness that the heavy town purple so last hot. year. Yeah, <laughs> horrible. Uh, it, would be, it would be nice if we, could, if we could rely on, on Ray. That would be nice for us to just be able to focus on the, on the beer and the conversation. And no worries, we share our beer liberally with Ray as well in appreciation. And that's right. There's a, a little bit of this bottle left for Ray, maybe. Uh, what do you think? How do, I, how do you I think this is warmed up nicely. I do think, I think it's going to be beautiful. I do yeah. think that the more aggressive grain bill complements that, that finish mm-hmm. and, and rounds out. I think that that's the only thing I might I might tweak further with this. So I might dial back the, the patent a little bit just because that is a, sure. a, a, a it's, heck it's of a good. heavy hammer to, to yeah. hit things with. And, and I did, I threw in a little bit of gambrinus to kind of try to round that off. A so. beautiful moment. Yeah, I might, I might back off, and I might do a smaller multi-rest reverse match, yeah. so a little less time at the lower temperature to pull those uh, complex sugars out. I think, I think, you know, we... Just a touch. It we doesn't we need diluted a, a, a little bit at the end. We added a little too much water, and I think I think you could uh, see this 
just a just a, uh, an ABV, one one ABV hotter and and. and well, that, you're right. That would bring yeah. the sweetness up too. You bring a bring both. Right. You bring the sugars and the was... alcohols all together up a bit. So that's just, that's why I say. I mean, I think it's, and, if, and if I, I tweak mean, anything, it's going to be very, very small yeah. in that regard. It, it's it's a beautiful beer, and, and it's it's been wonderful to try these both side by side and kind of get get a little bit of a perspective and and uh, see this from a distance. It's, yeah. it's it's a nice complement to the triangulation series we did too. Yeah. I mean, it's another way of kind of coming back and and like I was saying earlier, like we make new two for two. We just did a two we did for a two, two for section. two. If you haven't yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't label it as such, but yeah, it was just totally a two for two. You know, it was the same beer, but it was not the same beer. Not the as same we discussed. Beer. Hopefully, you got some sense that these are. Subtly different and, and enjoyably different, uh, the, uh, reflecting back on what we did and didn't do to make them so. Cheers. Cheers. Launch a goal. Launch a goal. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, you can find more information at livingproofbrewcast.com. If you have a question, suggestion, or correction, you can send that to feedback at livingproofbrewcast.com. Or if you want to reach us individually, you can send a note to John at or Thomas at livingproofbrewcast.com. We would like to thank the Internet Archive for media hosting and bandwidth. This show is licensed under the terms of a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 United States license. That means you're welcome to remix it, as long as you maintain attribution and you share your changes under a compatible license. Theme song is John Poole Tonic, written and performed by our own John Taylor.